Good morning, everyone. I'll be discussing our study with the section angle of extended uncertainty principle, dirty black hole. This study is an extension of the previous paper by Pantig et al. Here we added EUP correction term to the black hole to account for the quantum effects over macroscopic distances. From a Schwarzschild black hole, we added the dark matter halo model surrounding the black hole. And then here we will add the EUP correction to the mass function as shown. Thus, the metric function becomes as follows. We apply Gauss bonnet theorem to compute for the deflection angle. We converted the metric to the op two dimensional optical metric as required by the Gauss bonnet theorem, and we assume equatorial plane such that the theta is pi over 2. Then we use the deflection angle formula by Ishihara et al. as follows. And then uh, computing for the deflection angle, we got the following uh, equation. So for the far source and receiver case, so we impose u sub r is less than less than 1 and u sub s is less than less than 1, which shows that the receiver and the source are very far away from the black hole. And we got the approximated uh, deflection angle. So the EUP correction term here agrees with Kumaran et al's paper uh, that the EUP parameter increases the deflection angle. For the, uh, the dark matter significantly increases the deflection angle of light when it is concentrated near the black hole. As dark matter mass increases relative to the black hole mass, the deflection angle of light also increases. And here, the EUP correction term increases as well the deflection angle of light on top of the increase due to the dark matter effect. Here are the references and apologies. Thank you very much. It might be hard to imagine three or more regions sharing a common boundary, but this was demonstrated to be mathematically possible by Kunizo Yoneyama in 1917, and in fact was shown by recent studies to be common in nonlinear dynamical systems. A collection of three or more sets that share a common boundary is said to satisfy the WADA property. In this study, we consider the dynamics of charged particle motion in a weakly magnetized static black hole and demonstrate the WADA property by making a basin plot of the system. We give a vertical kick with energy E to a charged particle orbiting the black hole at a radius of rho, and then color the pixel depending on its final state as shown. Now, how do we actually check if different regions of the plot satisfy the WADA property? We do this using the observation that the WADA boundary remains unaltered under the action of merging the colors. However, because of the finite resolution of our plots, we can't expect the boundary to remain exactly the same. The best we can do is say that the boundary stayed the same to within some error of a small number of pixels. So, we do this for two cases of initial conditions, counterclockwise orbit and clockwise orbit. We also apply the merging method to another system that is known to be WADA, the Henon map. We see that the boundaries of the clockwise orbit case and the Henon map stay the same to within 8 pixels, while the counterclockwise orbit case stay the same to within 14 pixels, which is greater than our threshold. We conclude that the system is WADA, but only in the clockwise orbit case. In the future, we hope to investigate how the WADA property is affected as you vary the strength of the magnetic interaction. Thanks for listening. Discovering exoplanets have been done primarily in two ways. One is the radial velocity method, which uses the starlight Doppler shift, and second is by timing periodic planetary transits. However, what if the star exhibits no longitudinal motion and the planet does not cross the star? How do you detect an exoplanet in a transverse orbit? Hi, I'm Miguel from NIP UP Diliman. And in this video, we will be looking at simulations of vortex beams to better detect transverse stellar movement. From our view, stars with transversely orbiting exoplanets will wobble about their barycenter 
in a transverse motion as well. In our work, we simulated starlight in this case as an off-centered Gaussian beam rotating about the center. The electric field equation is then modified to accommodate a charge L, turning it into an optical vortex. In terms of the intensity, the optical vortex shows the movement more noticeably as compared to the off-centered Gaussian beam only. To make the movement more perceivable, we employed quadrant detection, subtracting the image's left half intensity to the right half. This intensity subtraction on the vortex beam yields a significant increase in signal compared to that with the off-centered Gaussian only, and this difference can be further increased with larger L. With known exoplanets having stars that wobble more than the simulated in this work, it may be possible to detect even smaller stellar movement with this technique. For more information, you may check the QR code on the manuscript below. Thank you. Today, I'm going to talk about linear emulator approach for bound orbits under the influence of the Pachinsky Vita potential. Recall the equations of motion for particles in a conservative force field. In the attempt to reduce the problem into a system of one-dimensional differential equations, we arrive at the Binet equation for the radial component. We see this equation when we prove Kepler's first law. However, we are interested in describing regions in which gravity is much stronger, such as around black holes. We can approximate these systems by using the so-called pseudo-Newtonian potentials one of which is the pachinsky vita potential. We find out that it turns the Binet equation into a nonlinear oscillator. Our goal, therefore, is to solve this differential equation to solve for orbits in the pachinsky vita bound system. This involves solving the nonlinear oscillator using approximate analytical techniques and comparing it with the Taylor series and numerical methods. The Taylor series of the pseudo force from equation 4 was already done by Wang and Zhuo. For this study, we used the least squares method, which can improve the approximation of the nonlinear pseudo force. We implement the least squares method by minimizing this integral with respect to the coefficients of the approximating linear pseudo force. We solve the bounds of the integral by exploiting classical mechanics. In comparing the pseudo forces, we see that the linear emulator provided better approximation to the pseudo force than the first order Taylor series. We quantify this comparison by, comp by calculating the precession angle of the three solutions. We also showed the plots of the inverse radius versus the azimuthal angle, as well as the polar plots. In conclusion, we are able to use the approximate analytical technique for nonlinear oscillators in solving orbits for a, for a Pakchinsky with a bound system. We show that this method performs better than the standard Taylor series expansion. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask by email. Superagents is a radiation enhancement process where objects can get energy away from dissipative systems. As a kinematic example, let us consider a ball coming in contact with a frictionful surface. Notice that when the cylinder is not spinning, or if it's spinning with the same velocity of the ball, then we end up in a state where the ball's final velocity is less than or equal to its initial velocity, respectively. However, something interesting happens when we let the cylinder spin faster than the ball. We actually get a scenario where the ball will get a kick from the friction of the cylinder when this condition is satisfied. This is known as the superagents condition. Now imagine a scalar field coming in contact with a strong electromagnetic step potential. As the field hits the potential at a certain frequency, we get a reflected wave whose amplitude is greater than the initial amplitude. What really happens here is that when we solve the equations of motion for this bosonic field, we get this relation. Here again we see the superagents condition. If satisfied, switches the sign of the term, making it a growth instead of a loss. We can clearly see this with this plot. The distinction between the superagent modes and the non-superagent modes. Performing a time domain analysis, we get a visual on how the wave path changes as it hits the potential. We can only observe superagents for bosonic fields and not for fermions. 
However, Vicente Cardoso and Lopez show that if you consider nonlinear Dirac fields, we can actually observe superregions. So we wondered, if the reverse will happen if you consider nonlinear bosonic fields, will superregions get quenched? Sadly, this is not what we found. We found something more interesting. In this plot, we again see modes of superregions and non-superregions, but we see a regime where we get perfect reflectance. Performing another time domain analysis, we can clearly see that the amplitude of the reflected wave is equal to the amplitude of the initial wave after heating the potential. We have shown that nonlinear interactions could potentially narrow down the space of superagent modes. However, we still have made a lot of assumptions in this work, which will only be improved upon further investigation. Good morning everyone, I'm Joshua Chozer Mugdang and I'm here to present a three-flavor model for the neutrino oscillation phenomenon. First, neutrino oscillation. It is a phenomenon in which neutrino flavors can turn into another flavor as it propagates through space. When it comes to theory, this phenomenon has been modeled throughout the years. One of such method is the standard approach that uses lepton mixing matrix in order to obtain oscillation probabilities of a three-flavor system. Another method was done by Sassaroli using coupled Dirac equations albeit in only two flavors. With this, we aim to extend the work done by Sassaroli to three flavors, and by employing her methods, solve for the energy eigenvalues and flavor wave functions of the system. However, this study focuses only on solving for the energy eigenvalues and flavor wave functions, which is a preparatory step prior to quantization. Next is the solution. For a two-flavor case, the propagation of a neutrino in a vacuum is shown below. When it has the possibility to turn into another neutrino, we add the flavor wave function of that neutrino governed by a flavor flipping parameter delta, which represents the oscillation strength. We then extend this to a three flavor case where a neutrino now has two possible states to oscillate into governed by different flavor flipping parameter, one for each flavor pair. We then proceed to solve the system by seeking a solution of the form shown below. Using equation five and six, we get equation seven. A non-trivial solution only exists when the determinant of the coefficient matrix vanishes or equals to zero, which will lead us to equation eight. We notice that equation eight can be reduced to a cubic equation. And by using Cardano's formula, we can get the energy eigenvalues of the system. Next would be solving for the neutrino wave functions. For the electron neutrino wave functions, we solve for chi two in terms of chi one, for the mu, chi four in terms of chi three, and for the tau, chi-6 in terms of chi-5. This is chi-2, this is chi-4, and this is chi-6. In conclusion, the neutrino oscillation phenomenon in a three-flavor system was described through the use of coupled Dirac equations. The coupled Dirac equations were solved and yielded energy eigenvalues that may be complex in nature. An expression for the flavor wave functions of each energy eigenvalue was also obtained. Thank you. We have been hunting for planets in life beyond our solar system for decades. One of the most reliable exoplanet detection methods is the transit method, wherein a planet passing through a star creates a dip in the brightness of the light curve. The problem with the transit method is that more often than not, the amplitude of the astrophysical noise and intensity fluctuations is larger than both the planetary signal and state-of-the-art instrumentation limit precision. But what if I told you that we can overcome such limitations using a new technique? Here I introduce to you the folded transit method. The folded transit method divides the host star into two areas of ideally equal intensities. This can be done using a spit detector. As the planet passes through the star, the intensity distribution of both areas will be measured. And from there, the intensity difference will be obtained resulting to the folded transit light curve. The rise and the dip corresponds to the area of the planet. From the weight of the overall curve, we can get the velocity of the planet using this equation. We can also use the slope of this line to obtain the velocity. Not only does our method remove the signal produced by the host star, it also increases the planetary signal by 100% as compared to the transit method. This curve, the rise and the dip, is automatically the signature of the planet making it easier to observe and characterize upon measurement regardless of how massive the host star is. Moreover, the random noises or fluctuations coming from the host star will be averaged out since we are subtracting two areas, 
both of which with random noises. Increasing the signal-to-noise ratio is crucial in detecting and characterizing exoplanets, and that is exactly what the Polish transit method offers. This has been Janelle Manuel. Thank you so much for listening. For more details, please scan the QR code below. Hello, my name is Gabriel Alguino, and today I will be presenting our work entitled Geometric Horizon for Distorted Black Holes. In this work, we constructed the geometric horizon for arbitrary first-order metric perturbations around a spherically symmetric black hole. Then, we performed the spherical harmonic decomposition. And finally, we applied the result to a simple example of a perturbed spacetime, a slowly evolving Vidya spacetime. Essentially, a geometric horizon is defined by the vanishing of some curvature invariant. This concept was first introduced by Page and Shum in this paper, where they showed that curvature invariants can be used to locate stationary horizons. However, the term geometric horizon was first introduced by Coley and McNutt in this paper. In our previous work, we showed that the geometric horizon for a perturbed static spherically symmetric black hole reduces to this equation in ingoing Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, where i is any well defined curvature invariant. This horizon coincides with a killing horizon when the perturbations are static. A natural question then to ask is for non-static spacetimes, can this provide a useful notion for black hole horizon? We then considered the simplest non-vanishing scalar invariant, in this case the Kretschmann scalar, and we found that the first order correction to the Kretschmann scalar is given by this equation. Then, we applied the formalism of Martel and Poisson to express our result in terms of spherical harmonics. Finally, we applied the result to the slowly evolving Vidya spacetime given by this metric. We found that the geometric horizon is defined by this equation. The physical interpretation of this horizon is left for future work. Thank you. Today, I'm Lemuel Gavin Saret from the National Institute of Physics. And today, I'll be giving a presentation titled Photon Scattering by an Alkyber Warp Drive done with my research supervisor, Dr. Ian Vega. So what exactly is a warp drive? Alkyber warp drives, to be specific, are exotic solutions to the Einstein's equations. It has an expanding and contracting mechanism wherein it expands the space behind an object and contracts the space ahead of the object, making it seem that the object is moving at speeds faster than light relative to a distant observer. The Alkyber warp drive is defined by the line element given below, where R sub S describes the center of the warp drive as it moves in time, and the function F is the Alkyber shape function. In the duration of this talk, we consider variables sigma, R and B, to be the warp bubble thickness, radius, and warp speeds respectively, with the following values given below. Now, if we have a beam of photons coming from the negative x infinity, and a warp drive from the positive x infinity moving to each other, the big question is how the warp drive would scatter these incoming photons. And to solve for that, we consider three sets of equations. First, the geodesic equations evaluated about our warp drive. Second, the displacement momentum relations with respect to an arbitrary variable. And lastly, our initial condition. In this setup, we call the constant value B as our impact parameter. These are the visualization of scattering of light in the Alkyber warp drive of different warp speeds. Notice that photons around the immediate vicinity of the warp drive experience strong lensing that makes light invert. Meanwhile, photons outside the warp drive vicinity experience weak lensing that makes photons tend to the center of the warp drive. Finally, we can solve for the deflection angles of the photon scattering and plot the resulting deflections with respect to the impact parameter for different warp speeds. The angular deflection increases as we increase the warp velocity, reaching an asymptotic value of pi over 2. Thank you for listening to my presentation. These are my references.